1984 Republican convention is over, Ronald Reagan renominated, and now the campaign is joined in earnest. Tonight, with two Republican women delegates and with two Democratic women who watched the Republican convention, we'll assess which party and which candidate, Mondale or Reagan, offers the most to American women. Funding for Idaho Reports is provided by the Friends of 4, 10, and 12, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by a grant from the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation. The 1984 Republican convention is over, Ronald Reagan renominated, and now the campaign is joined in earnest. Tonight, with two Republican women delegates and with two Democratic women who watched the Republican convention, we'll assess which party and which candidate, Mondale or Reagan, offers the most to American women. Good evening. Ronald Reagan was quickly out on the campaign trail today following his acceptance speech in the close of the Republican National Convention in Dallas last night. The president was in Chicago today telling the Convention of the Veterans of Foreign Wars that he has provided, quote, a better, safer, and more secure future. Walter Mondale was also in Illinois today repeating his call for a series of six television debates with the president this fall and asking Mr. Reagan to, quote, come clean and confess that he'll have to raise taxes next year. The real start of this campaign now finds both major political parties with several unanswered questions. For the Democrats, the questions look something like this. Can vice presidential candidate Geraldine Ferrero put her financial problems behind her? Can the Democratic campaign really get organized now? And will the Mondale all raise taxes and so will he gambit really pay off this fall? For Republicans, the potential problems are apparently overconfidence. And then there are apparently some serious Republican problems among minorities and perhaps with women. And that's our focus tonight. Which party and which candidate has the most to offer women voters this fall? We'll hear tonight from four women, beginning with two Republicans, State Representative Lydia Edwards of Donnelly and Carol McGregor Bettis of Boise. Both were delegates to the GOP convention in Dallas. Welcome to you both. Let me ask you both, the GOP platform said about equal rights for women, and I quote, all members of our party are free to work individually for women's progress. Some are suggesting that that's not exactly a ringing endorsement of equal rights for women. Representative Edwards? Well, Mark, um, the First Amendment guarantees individual expression of political views, and I think that plank in the platform reaffirms that support and frees us up to work towards progress in women's issues. I do not see it as an elimination of that effort at all. Um, I would have preferred that the ERA plank be left in, but I think we need to realize that if the ERA amendment were passed today, certain things are not going to change. They have to be worked with and worked on, and it's a gradual process, a process that's been taking 10 years and will continue to go on, and I'll continue to work as hard as I have for those rights. So I don't see it as a, as a, a dissolution or um, dilution of that issue at all. Do uh, you agree with that, Ms. Bettis? I think that the, the uh, equal pay for equal jobs, which the platform firmly endorses, is the crux of equal rights. Uh, over half of our population is women in the whole country, we are certainly not a minority group. And there are as many different interests within women's groups as there are within men's. The real concern about the election is in issues that face all human beings. And I found the platform overall to be very strong in asserting individual rights, free enterprise, continuing the economic program which addresses uh, inflation, which certainly touches us all as women or men. I want to come back to some of those things, but let me ask you, as a practical political um, issue, doesn't it look bad for Republicans to have not only uh, specifically rejected an equal rights amendment plank in the platform, but to have 
not even really mentioned it in so many words in the platform. Doesn't uh, uh, taking taking into account what yeah. you say okay. about the, the the desire being there to provide the equal rights? Isn't it a cosmetic problem at least? You're, you're almost getting at the dichotomy between President Reagan and his own daughter Maureen. Uh, President Reagan takes the point of view, I think, that this question is it is not worth mentioning that ERA is not the vehicle that he believes will bring women s more stature. Right. Maureen, on the other hand, feels that it is the vehicle which will bring women a better feeling about their stature. And uh, because of his dominance in this issue, in this one particular issue in the platform, the platform does not mention the endorsement of ERA. I do, it does mention some other specific things specifically for women, such as collecting child support, such as inclusion of homemakers on IRA, other issues which will help women. Uh, Representative Edwards, would you concede that uh, Mr. Reagan has, quote, a problem with women voters? I think to some extent there is that independent voter who will look at that and wonder. I think that women in Idaho are careful thinkers and they will not vote um, against him because of that. I think he will still have their support because of the other issues and the strength. Uh, s separate and distinct from the specific issue of equal rights, as a woman who perhaps is undecided about where, where to go in this election, just in a couple of words from each of you, why should a woman go to Ronald Reagan this fall rather than Walter Mondale, Representative Edwards? Um, Mark, I would think it would be the economy. In 1980, I supported Reagan because of two issues. One was that he promised to provide a safe home for our families and prosperity, jobs. And it is for those two reasons that I still support him and will continue to, even though we are at variance on the ERA question. Right. How about it? What, what, is there an issue that woman, women should look to and say, that's why I should go for Ronald Reagan? Yes, the record is why they should go for him. Peace and prosperity we have had in the last four years. We have addressed economic problems. We do have peace. And uh, there's a sense of pride that I think is worth continuing, and, and there's an effort going on. We'll come back. Thank you both. Let's view the situation now from the Democratic side, and that comes tonight from Lois Molina, who went to this year's Democratic convention as a delegate committed to Senator Gary Hart. Ms. Molina lives in Moscow, where she joins us tonight. Our other Democratic perspective comes from State Senator Gail Bray, a Democrat from Boise. Ms. Molina, let me ask you first. You just heard uh, Carol Bettis here say that, the, uh, that peace and prosperity is why a woman ought to vote for Ronald Reagan this fall. You have a different view, I'll bet. I think peace is the reason that uh, women should vote for Walter Mondale this fall. I think we have a choice between a president who jokes about bombing the Soviet Union and a, and a presidential nominee who is committed to a nuclear arms reduction. What about the economic issues that uh, Representative Edwards says? Well, I think we, um, we need to look at the deficits, and I think that's an important economic issue. And, a, and an issue that works against the president, I take Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Okay. Senator Bray, how about it? Why should, uh, why should women look to Walter Mondale this fall? Well, first I'd like to address the issue of women will not vote against Reagan solely because of the absence of the ERA in the platform. And I tend to agree with that. Uh, however, I think women will bring a series of issues with them to the voting booth this time. And I think on those series of issues, people will choose, uh, women will choose Mondale if, in fact, they bring this entire package. And that remains to be seen. That package includes for me uh, and for other women with whom I deal uh, both the issue of economic prosperity but also uh, long-term peace. We do have peace right now, but very tenuous peace, and we are in a constant state of threat with the aggressive nature with which our president has approached foreign relations. Um, the other thing that I think women will bring with them is uh, their concerns about the caring aspects of society, uh, where the social programs and where the support for the family has been seriously eroded. For those women who, women here who are talking tonight have equality of opportunity. I truly believe that in most every aspect. We're talking about the people who are below the poverty line. And for those people, it's not there and it's gotten worse in the past few years. Give me an example. 
Well, in the area of, of income, for one, for uh, single families uh, with children, uh, there are more people who have fallen below that poverty line in the last four years. And for those people, the situation has gotten worse, not better. In Idaho itself, we reduced the number of people on AFDC in Idaho uh, because the restrictions, the qualifications for, for eligibility were reduced as a result of a federal mandate. That has happened nationwide. Now, people vote on perceptions. Uh, and unfortunately, the perception that the Republican Party, not even philosophically, has endorsed uh, equality for women, I think will hurt them. It remains to be seen whether they bring the other factors with them and in a package see that uh, Mondale and the Democratic Party will offer them more than the Republican Party. I think let, me, let me just interrupt okay. you there to, to, to see if Lois Molina agrees that it will take more than just a perception that Republicans don't support equal rights for women. Oh, yes, I think they're, they're, people vote on a number of issues, and equal rights is, is just one of them. Um, the, the whole issue of, of restoration of cuts to education that, that the Democrats are committed to, um, environmental issues, uh, economic issues, these, these all go into to what brings people to the voting booth. Okay, you were going to make another point. I was I'm just going to say that um, I think the seeds of a shift or an alignment by women with the Democratic Party have been sown uh, in this year of 1984, much as they were sown in the 60s with the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the, the uh, voting rights uh, protection for blacks. And at that time, the blacks saw that the party that was truly going to address their needs uh, from the grassroots up was the Democratic Party. And I think that women are going to see that those people who feel it is an issue of significance, one worth mentioning in the platform, we are worth mentioning. And I think that the Dem Democrats have shown that forthrightly, and I'm proud of it. Uh, final comment on that, Ms. Molina? Yes, I, I agree. I think um, that the Democratic platform is specific about women's rights, and not just the Equal Rights Amendment, but also comparable worth and daycare and pension reform and a lot of issues that are specific to women. And we, need, we do need that specific mention as well as these other general issues. Well, finally, to you two Democrats, I'm wondering if, if uh, despite the case you make here, if uh, the so-called Republican problem with women voters is not, in, in some way, just sort of wishful thinking. By, by the Democrats talk about it so much, they say there's a gender gap, and the polls show it to some degree. But isn't there a little bit of wishful thinking there on the part of, uh, this is another constituent group that Democrats can appeal to in a way? Well, there was certainly wishful thinking on my part when I ran for office, and I found it to be a great advantage to be a woman running for office. And I think the, uh, the desire to have a woman on the ticket and the ability to mention in the platform that we support these issues that truly do bring women to a place where they have an equality of opportunity uh, is important, and I think it will be a significant thing that women will look to. None of those individually will make the difference. Collectively, more women are voting, and I think more women will choose the Democratic Party because they will feel with that party they have the greatest identity for what their specific needs are at the present time. Well, let me open this up and uh, sort of go through these issues one by one and ask you all to, uh, to join in the conversation whenever you would like. First, on the, on the question of the economy, um, again, Gail Bray says uh, women are going to be worried about the caring aspects of society, the AFDC payments and things like that, that have been affected in a way by the austerity moves that the Reagan administration has made. Will that cut against Republicans? Well, Mark, I think that, that it may, if people do not fully understand exactly what, what is happening and what the record is. But I think Reagan has demonstrated his interest in caring uh, by signing that child support collection bill last week. That was significant. I remember when I was raising my son, it would have been tremendous to have that money. And so I think that women everywhere will rejoice because they're going to get some help. He's helping them in many ways similar to that. So I use his record and those examples as his caring. Senator Bray? Well, um, the wishful thinking aspect might be there. Uh, however, I think the issue, one of the foremost issues that I feel was also not mentioned in the Republican platform was the nuclear arms reduction issue. And as, as, as mothers with children, I think there's no issue which bears more importance to me uh, than that one. 
And I think that right now the, the frightful situation in which we uh, have relations with other countries is one which we cannot allow to continue. Economic prosperity, everything else aside, uh, the mention of comparable worth, I think the issue of, of peace and, and probable peace, where we know that we are moving towards something other than a war as a solution to our problems, is what we must have, or all these other issues really aren't worth our discussion here today. And I think that is another thing that's going to bring a lot of women into the Democratic Party. Uh, I, hate, I hate for us to move from either party from a position of fear. And I feel that going on. There's a certain manipulation through fear about nuclear arms. I am very happy that we are able to defend ourselves and I am even happier that the president said in his acceptance speech last night that he hopes to work for reduction of nuclear arms. He hopes to meet with Soviets to discuss this and the facts bear that in the last four years there has not been communist overtaking of countries such as there were in the Carter and Mondale years. So we really are safer now than we were four years ago? I feel that we are and I don't think this is a woman's issue again. It, this is an issue that's very basic, this, this use of, the, of, of how you feel about being safe and how you feel about where your peace is. Uh, Lois Molina, uh, safer or not safer than we were four years ago? Well, President Reagan is the first American president in 20 years to not reach a significant arms control agreement with the Soviet Union. And I, I agree with Gail Bray that... Well, he, let me just interrupt you there. He says, they, uh, of course, the reason for that is because the Soviets have walked out of the discussions in Geneva. Well, I, I think that um, perhaps they're responding to, um, to the president and, and indications some of his... Um, rhetoric um, and maybe believe that he is not as, as committed um, as he should be to those arms negotiations. I, why are you convinced that Walter Mondale would do better on this so-called war and peace issue than Mr. Reagan? I feel that, that the platform commits him to it for one thing and he has, has said throughout the campaign that he is in favor of a mutual verifiable nuclear freeze and that to me um, just it rings true uh, based on Reagan's had four years to try and he's, he's not succeeded and I think I feel Mondial is committed to this and sees it as a top priority. I, I really feel that more important than rhetoric is the fact of what's happened and there, ha there has not been communist takeover of other of other countries. Well that she says they are that there committed. hasn't been a significant agreement reached to, to limit the threat of... But all the other planet. agreements that, that she refers to did not limit the actual takeover either. Well, we're not talking about necessarily takeover by communist countries. We're talking about the possibility of a nuclear war, of, of some kind of uh, skirmish escalating into a nuclear war. And someone mentioned the, the fear factor. I heard that a lot during the Republican convention that the Democrats are trying to paint a gloomy picture. Well, we don't like to think about nuclear war. It is, it is a dreadful possibility, and it's easy for people to back away from, from the mere thought of that and, and to feel complacent and to feel that we are safe. But we're not safe until we can, can get some kind of, of a nuclear arms control agreement. I, I pray that the, that the president will get this. I do, and I also congratulate him for his stance on international trade. Rather than getting in a dead heat and a stalemate locking of horns over rhetoric, I think it's important to trade with each other. And the platform specifically outlines that embargoes will not be used for political purposes anymore, that the trade for the grain agreements will continue, and they've already, they've already uh, had talks about how they will continue. I think trade, mutual benefit from our relationships with each other is a very positive direction to go right. in this relationship. Senator Bray, I, I guess uh, regardless of how, what side of this conversation right here you come down on, it sort of makes the point that you were making earlier, as I understood it at least, that it's going to take more than just a woman's issue like ERA 
to, to bring women to one or the other political party this fall? Well, there will be some women who will vote exclusively on that issue, but I think the vast majority will bring with them uh, a basket full of several yeah. of these other issues about which we've expressed concern. And I'm hopeful that the, that the debates will occur so that those of us who don't bring the zeal of conventions uh, can see the real difference between the solutions that will be proposed. And hopefully based on that, people will vote on perception but more on fact, and hopefully those will come off in the future. Senator Edwards, let me let me change the subject a little bit here to talk about the vice presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket. Do you think women will vote, some women, maybe a, a lot of women, will vote this fall on the basis of there is a woman on one of the tickets in one of the major parties and we're going to go that way? I think it would be foolish of me to assume that I was elected because of my gender. Maybe two or three people voted for me because I'm a woman, but I was never questioned about those issues when I was campaigning. We talked about substantial issues, and I think we would be undermining the political process to assume that people will vote for Geraldine Ferraro because she's a woman. They may vote for her because she's a capable woman, a capable person. And I did hear her speak, and uh, she's an astute politician. But I don't think anyone will vote for her just because she is a woman. Senator Bray? I agree with that entirely. Okay, so what, uh, what, uh, what pluses does she bring or minuses does she bring in that regard if, if people are not going to vote for her just because she's a woman? People will not vote for her just because she is female, but they will vote for her because she's a competent, able female who has the first opportunity to take a leadership position in the United States of America. I think that is a significant reason for voting for someone. Now, if she appears not to be competent, if she appears to be someone to whom they cannot relate and, with, and, and in whom they do not place a great deal of trust, then I do not think people will vote for her. Is this whole business of her finances contributing to that concern, do you think? I think the way she has handled that has been uh, exemplary. And I, I've been very impressed with that. It's very unfortunate. But as the first woman candidate, she's going to come under some extra duress. And I think it's appropriate that the press ask these questions, that those issues are resolved for the American public. But I think she's done that in an exemplary fashion. Well, Mark, I think yes. she's been mishandled also. I think the Mondale campaign did not take proper care of her and advise her. In, in what way? Well, she has been um, the, the one who has been on the, hot on the campaign trail and speaking out vigorously, as it should be. But I believe that um, all of this exposure in a negative way may have been mishandling on Mondale's part. So well, Bert, Bert Lance is another example of that. Frankly, I think uh, those were her problems, and if she can answer those for the American public, she should. I don't think Mondale should look after her. In that. Yeah, does she, uh, Lois Molina, does she, uh, Geraldine Ferrell, still bring something to the Democratic ticket despite these problems that that in a way transcends these problems? I think so. I just returned from the Midwest when I, where I was talking to some of my relatives and one of them is a lifelong Republican woman who is giving some serious thought to voting Democratic this time chiefly because Ferraro is such a, a capable woman. Another is a lifelong Democrat who doesn't like Ferraro um, but isn't going to let that stop her from voting for Mondale. So I think she may be helping the ticket and certainly isn't hurting it. Final Mark, could we, talk, sure. excuse me, could we talk a little bit about uh, something Senator Bray said, uh, philosophically, Republican, of course, is a demonstration of what the Republican Party has done as opposed to the importance of eliminating the ERA plank. For instance, uh, we have always been, the Republican Party, the banner party. It was uh, a Republican woman who was the first ambassador to a foreign country, of course. Uh, Claire Booth Luce and Ann Armstrong was Republican and first ambassador to Great Britain. Jeanette Rankin was first Republican congresswoman. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith was nominated not as vice president but as president and she was a Republican. Sandra Day O'Connor and uh, there are other examples of this. The Republican Party has demonstrated its caring for its women all along. Well, so I, you make the case that uh, the president makes, uh, that uh, Senator Bray, uh, that he has three women in his cabinet, uh, the ambassador to the UN among, among them. Uh, he did appoint the first woman to the Supreme Court. At least at the highest levels of government, that's a pretty good record, isn't it? You've hit the nail on the head. At the highest levels of government, uh, those people have had the opportunity and have made the most of it and have been recognized for that and been placed in positions of responsibility. I think both parties can point to those types of individuals. I think what we're talking about is the vast 
rest of the, of the women in this country who do not have equality of opportunity and for whom the ERA is a significant factor. Uh, Representative Edwards has admitted herself that she thinks it's, it's needed and she will work towards those ends. Uh, it's one thing to appoint competent people to positions and say there, see I support those competent individuals. It's another to make that opportunity available to the vast majority and that's what I'd like to say. Well see. I am a vast majority. I live in Idaho and I have had all the opportunities I believe on the local level and I believe those kinds of appointments do translate into credibility at this level. But no party has, has, a, uh, has a preemption on who has appointed the most people in those positions. That, that really isn't an issue here. Who has, who has the most competent women in the most responsible positions? I think the issue is what are we doing about the rest of them? And that's, that's where I think the issue comes down. Yes what are we doing about the rest of them it's not it's not a function of government in my opinion the the problems that women have had have been more of a result of cultural cultural problems than governmental problems the government cannot solve these things the idea that a man or a woman does not feel confident of themselves or competent is a function of their individual progress and I think uh, the role models that, that have entered into our culture for many years take time to address. Tremendous changes have been made in the last 10 years in this regard. They are individually addressed. They are addressed by organizations such as the YMCA, YWCA, excuse me, their Women in Management program, which addresses competence in women, the capability of women to have confidence in making decisions. So it's more These of an attitude up and down psychological things, not political yeah. things. And I don't think that we can really be fair on either side to say that either political party has the, should even have the prerogative to decide these matters. These are vastly vast psychological changes that take time to make. Ms. Molina, do you want to comment on that? I think a lot of problems of, of women are economic problems and certainly do need to be addressed by government. And we, we are seeing uh, more people below the poverty line thanks to, to Reagan's um, economic policies, and that needs to be changed. Disagree with that? Yes, I do. I think that uh, we have a better economic record in the last four years than the previous four without any question, particularly for older people of both genders. Well, Inflation is down, the deficit is down. These are across the board facts that affect every human life in this country. We did have this report last week, though, from uh, a, a, the Urban Institute, which is thought to be a fairly bipartisan group that said the rich got rich and the poor got poorer during the first four years of the Reagan administration. Not, you don't see it that way, Representative Edwards? No, I don't. Again, I point to the record of of changes in, in for women where it touches us most at the local level and I disagree with Mrs. Molina. Yep. More over a million of the new jobs in the last 19 months went for women. A million more went for women than for men. There's um, the unemployment has gone down. Okay, Ms. Molina, I'm going to give you the last word if you want it in 15 seconds or so. Well, I think um, another important point as with regard to who women are going to vote for has to do with whether women are registered to vote. And we need to remember that a third of the women who are eligible to vote in this election are not registered. And we need to, both parties need to reach out to women and get them eligible to vote, or registered to vote rather, so that they can have their say in this okay. election. That's well, a wonderful that's a good, point. Good plug, and we appreciate Absolutely. you making it. Thank you for joining us tonight in Moscow. We appreciate it. Senator Bray, Representative Edwards, and Mr. Bettis, thank you. For, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, you very thank much. You, we'll be back on Monday night. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night. Funding for Idaho Reports is provided by the Friends of 4, 10, and 12, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by a grant from the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation.